Welcome to the Invested Teacher Podcast with Kyle Pierce, Matt Bigley, and John Orr. Hey folks, get ready to be taught as we share our successes and our failures, um, you know, encountered during the real life lessons learned uh, on how to build generational wealth from the ground up. Welcome, Invested students, to another episode of the Invested Teacher Podcast. And uh, sadly, there we, we are only uh, two-thirds of the crew here today because Matt is out there. Uh, no He's just slugging. Ground. He's slugging I know, it. I know. He's slugging He's it. Closing deals like a madman. It is a Friday when we're recording this, which is a big day for closes. But he also has a couple other deals on the go as well. So he sends his best regards. We're actually going to bring a puppet on the show and like play it. Just to have him sit there. Yeah. Just to like have have, have, set up somebody over here on the side. He would say nothing. But either way, uh, Matt will be with us hopefully in the next episode. Yes, definitely. So hopefully he'll have to listen to this and see whether. Uh, whether we reached the mark here uh, for the episode. You'll have to so, give her the feedback for sure, for sure. <laughs> John, uh, give us a heads up as to what we're going to be diving into today. And actually, this one, it works out nicely because both you and I, uh, this episode idea sort of began as a deal. And yeah. uh, it sort of evolved into an awesome opportunity to share uh, the process almost in the moment, uh, a couple hours almost. removed from the yeah. moment. Happened Give today. them a rundown. What happened here? Happened today. So, yeah, this uh, this uh, this is actually, uh, like you were saying, a good one because because Matt is not the numbers guy. He always kind of says that. And we're going to talk about numbers today. We're going to dive into our re- kind of a, like Kyle said, almost a real uh, real-time analysis of a deal that came across our desks um, today. And uh, we're going to kind of dive into how to look at uh, this particular deal. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a bigger deal. It's, it's a multifamily, larger number of units, like 11 units in this deal. So we're going to look at this deal. Uh, we're going to kind of analyze it, thinking about what do you look at when deciding on whether this is the right one for you? Um, how do you know when you should toss it out? Like this is the wrong one right away? Like we'll talk Talk about that. Uh, we'll kind of dive into the numbers, um, and then uh, Kyle. I think th- one of the big ideas here is that is that good deals are not just found; they're made. Oh, absolutely! It's, it's a great way to articulate it. This one really caught my eye. First of all, because it wasn't actually on the MLS. Anytime something is not on the MLS, it's like a, mm. you you sort of get like a more you know more interest right out of the gate. You're like, huh, I want to know more about this, and really happened through a contact. Uh, I think it was a contact of a contact who uh, has a wholesale deal. That's uh, basically what that means is these are people who go out and their work is to find good deals and try to sell those good deals to other people, typically mm-hmm. investors, mm-hmm. right? So what they're doing is they're trying to essentially make money on the spread. Now, for you and I, John, and for Matt, I mean, ideally, if we had our systems in place and all the time in the world and we were dedicated and focused on that strategy, we'd probably be trying to wholesale or find right. wholesale Seems deals like for a good ourselves. Deal. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they are great deals. And that's really, I think, one of the main reasons why buying a wholesale deal Regardless of how much money they're going to take off the top, it doesn't actually matter because they did all of the hard work. We don't know if they looked at like 20 properties or 500 or 2,000 properties before they found this one. But ultimately, at the end, they're going to get paid back for finding a good deal and then also finding the person who wants to buy it for a higher price price. All right. So let me get this straight. So just to wrap all of our listeners minds around the kind of the the, the beginnings of, of what's happened here is you're saying that they're they're this this company or this group or this um, this uh, maybe this organization has goes out and looks for a property um, just like we do and just like, you know, most people do who are investment uh, uh, uh property investment uh, people like us. Uh, and then- uh, Investors, uh, John, I think they're called. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, so, so, and then they, and then they buy it and then they don't flip it. This is not a flip, right, Kyle? This is not like they put money into it and then they're gonna resell it. They're just gonna buy it and then hopefully resell it at a higher price. 
Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you can you can do it any way you'd like, but in this particular case, and in many cases like this, they call this an assignment deal. So basically, what they've done is they've found a seller, they found a vendor, someone who is trying to sell the property, and yep. bef typically before it hits the MLS, right? Because then okay. otherwise everybody else knows about it. Right. That's what I was thinking. Um, so they're they're finding someone, and they might do this by letter dropping, right? You may have even received one of these letters where it says we're you know we're buying homes in your area uh, right, oftentimes yeah. they make it look like it's a handwritten note or whatever try to make it more personable or you might see bandit signs where it says we buy houses with yeah, you know a I've number on it lots of these uh we say groups or organizations oftentimes just a, a team of a, you know one and you know one or more people who are trying to find people who are interested in selling and then oftentimes they're interested in selling, but there's something else going on there. Like usually you'll see people who are like, you know, say like a hoarder who's like, I could never sell my house because no one's going to buy it. You might get someone who wants to wholesale and actually buy that property. Oftentimes flippers do the same thing, right? They're right, actually right. letter dropping, cold calling, yep. all of those things. So it, it can take quite a bit to prospect and try to find these deals. In this particular case, these wholesalers actually have two buildings under contract. Mm -hmm. So they what what has happened is they likely found either an investor who's maybe just wants to get out and doesn't want to deal with the process. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. maybe it might be something like these investment properties were actually like inherited into um, you know, somebody else's possession. So maybe okay. a son yeah. or a daughter of, yeah. of a you. landlord who's passed away and they're going like, we don't know what to do with it. And they just want to get it off their hands. Uh, it could be maybe the bank has tried to repossess those properties. Maybe that for whatever reason, their taxes haven't been paid or something like that. And oftentimes these people who are wholesaling or flippers who are looking for good deals on properties, they'll try to identify properties even just by driving by and seeing like maybe the, maybe the yard's not being well kept. It's like, hmm, there's something mm -hmm. fishy going on here. And then they might start trying to inquire who owns the property and offering to purchase the property for X mm -hmm. amount of dollars. So that's sort of what's landed uh, this particular deal in our lap. We've got wholesalers who have these two properties under contract and the deal closes in advance or, or down ah, the road. So in this right. particular case, this is we're in March right now and this deal closes at the end of April. And their goal here, when you are assigning a property, your goal is to try to find Offload someone it. who wants the property. And then the deal will actually get assigned on closing day. So basically you'll sign Got like it. a separate agreement. Everyone will go to the lawyer. And then basically you will now be the one purchasing instead of this original wholesaler. So the wholesaler basically- Never like owns this, it. They never own it. They like Got hold. It. They own the contract. They own the rights. It's like an option. If you're, That's what you're I was trading say. the stock, it's just market. like an option. Absolutely. And if this option expires, you're gonna have to pay. It's like selling a put for those people who have done the wheel strategy or any of that stuff before. It's like same idea. So right now they're trying to figure out. It's like a hot potato for them. They're like, who wants this? property and ideally if they've done well with this particular deal they're like we have enough profit in there to make it worth our while and to ensure that there's someone who's going to want this property right, right. instead of us yeah that's uh that's an interesting it's like it's like buying a call right you buy the you buy the right to buy that that thing in the later uh, the later thing and you're going to sell that call hopefully it goes up in value so so uh kyle let's well, well i would argue i would say it's more like selling a put because you're gonna have to buy the stock if it expires in your possession so you're gonna have to actually buy a hundred shares true. of that company right so here you're gonna have to buy this property that's true or you're gonna take a loss on the down payment or the deposit that you put we're getting in. technical so you, now <laughs> yeah totally but uh, you know that's a future episode we will get into options right. trading which is which is great but right. today we'll talk about this particular yeah. assignment scenario yeah and like, like you said so so one thing I want to, you know, talk about with you before we get into the actual numbers is kind of the the makeup of this property. So we've got we've got a property that's got two different buildings on site, and and you're buying them at group. Kyle, what do you think? 
like we we want what we want to do is help help people understand like what's a good deal what's a bad deal when do you like shut one down what are we thinking right now remember we're doing trying to do like a real-time analysis but w as we kind of just chat through whether we want to you know go into this or not but kyle you got two properties or really one property, two buildings. Uh, the fact that I have two roofs, you know, two foundations, two of everything, you know, um, one of the one of the selling points of us going into multifamily properties is that you only had the one roof and the one foundation, and you got all the, you know, you, yeah, you have multiple people living in there. But I mean, like now I have two buildings uh, for eleven units. Like like you guys own one building that has nine units. Now we're gonna go two buildings, eleven units. What are your th what's your thoughts initially right now on owning two buildings for this one deal? Is there yeah, any like no. any 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 thought there or is it doesn't even matter in a sense of, well, if you were owning two different, you know, different properties, you still have to budget the same way. Yeah, totally. I, w I would argue. I mean, the, the interesting part is it's like really if the numbers work, then it's worthwhile. Right. So right. it's like for us, it really does come down to numbers. But you bring up an interesting point. Would I prefer that it's like one building, one property? In some ways, yes, because like you said, like it's like it's it's tight, it's tidy, it's one property yeah, to yeah. own, it's one property tax bill. This is actually two buildings on two separate parcels of land. So now we've got actually two tax bills. We've got mm -hmm. uh, double the you know double the the amount of. So I you're suppose, buying two hassle. properties, one you're that's a three unit, properties. one that's an eight unit in this particular case now mm -hmm. there's also some benefits to that in the future as well that you could go well listen like we if you can get this for the right deal and you feel good about it and uh, once again for us we ch chatted in the flip um in the flip episode about how we want to make sure that we're cash flowing so if we can get this for a cash flow price and then now we have the option as well in the near or long-term future to really sell right. one of the two properties and potentially keep one. So right. there is some bonus in there for sure. But once again, it really does come down to the numbers. Um, of course, the, you know, the condition of the buildings and all of those things are really uh, important. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm, I'm going to share yeah. my screen for Let's those who in. are on, you, on YouTube. We're going to dig in. Now, I've copied and pasted a lot of the information to just a Google Doc. It's not formatted or anything like that. And the only reason why is because I don't want to, you know, make it look like we're advocating to like, you know, share a deal here, like and, and get people all excited about one. But this is a real deal. This uh, I've got the real uh, information over here and I've just copied and pasted it over. I just didn't want anything identifying the actual building who's selling it and all of those mm -hmm, things because mm -hmm. I don't want them to be upset if you know we're saying it's a good deal or a bad deal and vice versa. So here we are, we're looking at it. And when I look at this, John, this is the first thing that I saw right. with this particular the deal. Purchase price. I saw purchase price, but there was also something else that got me interested here right away just to look a little deeper. Now, of course, I'm going to look a little deeper regardless, but right away I was like, hmm, this could be good. Do you want to take a guess at what it was? Uh, I got a couple Ooh, things. A couple things. So, so, like so I got a wholesale price. So I'm just going to read it so that the people listening can see what I, we're seeing here. It says wholesale price of basically we got like 1.4 million, a uh, million three hundred eighty thousand, and then in brackets assignment fee included. Uh, and then we have a two in one property deal, the 11 units and the eight plex, uh, and an, uh, 11 units, and an eight plex and a triplex. Um, so there's the two properties right there. And then we have 125,000 per unit in prime area. Now, Kyle, I got two guesses out of those four different statements. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with one that we've chatted about. Um, usually the, this is the one that we use as a, almost like a guide in a sense of like, whether this is the right one or should we even dive in to this, which is the, uh, 125 per unit, 125,000 per unit, uh, in a prime area. Now I think it's more of the 125,000 per door is what we're, I'm going to guess that that is what uh, kind of sucked you into this, because I know that when we've looked at uh, a number of deals and we start to look at, well, it's it's easy to take the price, divide it by how many units and come up with this number when you're first looking at a deal. And so when you get one that's like, 
you know, uh, you know, this is going to be depending in your area. You know, if you're in a, if you're in, say, Toronto, it's going to be a different not kind of number that's going to entice you. Like you might be like, hey, 250,000 a unit might be a great thing for you. Maybe not. Um, so I'm going to guess that one, Kyle. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should. Uh, is that right? That is absolutely correct. That 125. Now, keeping in mind too, I should mention that this these two properties are actually not in our local area. So right, right away, it's like that attracts me based on our local area because we know that it is hard to find, you know, uh, mm -hmm, even 150 mm -hmm. per unit right now in multifamily. Yep. When you look at one of these is a triplex and triplexes are like, you know, right now they're at like 200 K a unit and things like that. And of course these prices adjust and, you know, people sometimes take less, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that right there, um, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And, you know, I, I will look past, I'm going to just show for those who are looking like you look at these buildings, they are not purpose built. So that's something no, for you they, just to uh, They're know. like add-ons. So There's like a, you know, like they're, they're going to toss something on here. They're going to add on here. They kind of, they yep. look like a hodgepodge. Totally. So when the, when it's a hodgepodge now, to be honest, that's like uh, that's like one of our specialties is the hodgepodge. Right. Like we actually like to pick <laughs> up things that other people don't necessarily like, you know, like we don't want to get the one thing, the the purpose built property, even though it's great when it is purpose built, it's all you're going to pay a premium for that. So yeah. I look at this and I go, mm, there might be opportunity here, but it also raises some red flags because right away I go, is this actually legal? Like, is this a legal triplex right. that we're looking at right now? And you know, when we look at some of the other pictures, uh, here's just the other side of it. Mm. All right. Okay. Looks like it's, a business. Yeah. Like it looks like it may have been commercial at some point on the front. Um, so again, like, is this all zoned appropriately? These are things we're going to have to look into, of course, if we, if we want to go deeper here. Uh, but again, the numbers for me is where I want to start. Here's the, uh, I believe it's the eight unit. Yep. Um, so this one definitely looks pretty. That's more, purpose. Yeah. I say it looks more purpose built, mm -hmm. um, but you know, even just looking at this, this might be. I, it's a very old building. Maybe it's a furnace. Who who knows? Like a uh, an actual. Um, oh, you mean a fireplace? There it is. Uh, one of those things you 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 you, uh, you put fire in and the smoke comes out. You there put fire in. <laughs> um, but so I look at this. This one looks more purpose built, but again, you'd still want to do some due diligence there. Again, looks tidy. Definitely older building, right? So again, that's something to note. I see um, some some. Air There's like three doors there. in the front. I got three doors in the front, and then it looks like maybe this side door might be a back unit of some mm -hmm, type. Mm -hmm. So again, looks like enough parking, um, but just visually. You know, you're just getting a sense here of where this is. Oh, there's the uh, maybe the other. Uh, yeah, it one looks. Of the other it, it doesn't look pretty. It doesn't look pretty. It looks. Yeah, it looks it, rugged. And, and honestly, rugged. the one thing, the one thing that you know, we have to always reiterate when investors come in and they want to invest for the first time. Oh, the shopping cart's yeah. a nice touch too. I always yeah, appreciate. Yeah. Uh, usually, when I send it in our Slack channel to uh, to Matt and John, I always make a comment about something in the yeah. photo. I like, like I the, like the you know, multiple the tire is the nice touch over here, you know. I like the multiple dishes, you know, like they're just boom, multiple satellite, satellite dishes, dishes like everywhere. Right Absolutely, yeah. so good stuff there. But we don't let that distract us. We're not worried about that. We're going to be looking and trying to figure out, okay, how, like, how does this work? Now, something that immediately, immediately uh, allowed, or, or I guess gave me a little bit more excitement about this possibility was we got this deal. You see the dates up on the screen. It says offers are due on March 26th. And when I got this in my hands, it was March 30th. Right. So four days after they were claiming offers are due, I think it's actually still a poor choice. Yeah. yeah, from a marketing perspective, it's a poor choice for them to not update that or just remove it completely because you have a due date that you're now passed and that suggests to me that obviously nothing is materialized yet. Yeah. So right away I'm going, opportunity here, who knows? So as we go down, we of course read the property features, um, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff talks about eight units in one, right? Uh, you know, well maintained. All of those things are important and great. It's kind of like you're scanning those because what we're really looking for, right? Is is you're kind of like you're kind of going over that and going, no, you know what? I can still go back and look at that stuff later. I'm looking to see if after I know the purchase price, I know that maybe there's a little bit of a deal possibly here because of the things you've mentioned. 
Um, probably a couple things I might be scanning for Kyle is one is, uh, right. I probably would scan right to whether we'll look at what the income levels are. Like what are mm. the rents currently? Like, are, is it, is it vacant? Is it not vacant? Um, can we set our own rent or, or if they're already, you know, rents ready to go, can we, can we have a peek at those? And then also, uh, I know this is an assignment um, situation, but I was I would probably also if this wasn't this situation, look for whether it's like a vendor take back scenario or they are open to that. You kind of scan these ads or scan these listings to look for these kinds of things, because we need we want to see the numbers here so that we can toss them in our in our analyzer and uh, and run the numbers to see if this is uh, this is appropriate or not. I love it. Yeah. So that's exactly what we did. We, we scanned all the way down. We've got the income now they've, they place income on each. They haven't necessarily, and I, I'll do a quick search cause, uh, yeah. So there's, it, it doesn't say vacant. No, I don't or, think let so. Let me see occupied. Ocu nope. Nothing about. So m our assumption here, which would be something we have to check. They're showing rents for all 11 units. Yeah. Um, and they're describing them. So our assumption is that this is fully occupied, at least initially. So that's the assumption we're going to make when we start playing with these numbers. Something I really appreciated was they gave us the monthly cash flow number. So I didn't have to like individually plug and play all 11 in. That's annoying. But right here, I look and I go, okay, $9,750 per month at current rents. Now, in the descriptor, they talk about how there's an opportunity for a higher ROI. So oftentimes this has to do with like raising rents, which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is good. That's great to have, but that's not a, like that's not, it's marketable, but it's not helpful for pricing because really what they should do is that the, the seller should up the rents and then sell because then the cash flow will be higher. Right, right. now I look at the cash flow, I go, I'm gonna base my decision on this cash flow. And with $9,700 or just over that, I think to myself and I go, wait a second, $9,700 and 1.4 million. We're not at the 1% rule, but we've talked before about yeah. how it's hard to hit that 1% rule these days. So mm -hmm. right away I go, well, okay, if 9750 divided by four, uh, four, 1.4 thousand or sorry one the other way the other way around million math teacher here it is uh what i look and i see i'm like okay what do i have here i have like about 0.7 percent yeah. which isn't bad like that's actually like something that attracts me so i've got a low per unit cost I'm looking at the rents. I don't know this area or this market as well as I know the market we're in. So it's like I right now can't really make any assumptions based on like whether these are low rents or not. Like mm -hmm, usually mm -hmm. if it's local, I know right away. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going, okay, I still feel good because we're close to the 1% rule. I'm like, there could be some meat on the bone here. And as I roll down, I see they've even given us some comps. They had them listed and linked on MLS, uh, 11 unit in the same area yeah. for 1.8 yeah. million mm -hmm. and an 11 unit um, for 1.79 million. So about 1.8 million again. So they've got two comps there. Uh, we looked at the comps. The comps are, I'm going to They're a little nicer. They're a little, little nicer. They were a little, a little nicer tighter, and you know? a little nicer. We did run the numbers on those two, which we can chat about after. Um, and and kind of did, did a little bit of comparison, but yeah, they looked a little nicer. I think they're a little bit more closer to some nicer areas as well. Yeah, and something that uh, immediately jumped out at us and those who are watching on the screen, you'll see like listed are the expenses yearly. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. right away, I, I noticed something. I noticed the hydro and gas is $22,000. Yep. So I'm going, hmm, $22,000 is actually more than that. Uh, divided by 11 units, that's like 2,000 in hydro and gas. So it, really what it's telling me is that each unit is probably, this is inclusive in their units, right? So that's obviously mm -hmm. a negative. So right. those rents, even though maybe some of them might look high, a couple of them look low, um, that hydro and gas is a red flag for us. And it yep. makes me go, wait a second, are there even separate meters? Sep uh, I believe meters. this one did have that. Let me look at that. So it says two separate civic addresses. What else uh, do we have here? Separate. I had... uh, oh, 
Okay. How about? No. Um, you know what? I don't think so. I've, that must have been on one of the comps that I was looking yeah. at. And then right away, if it's not there, what I would do is I would quickly look at the pictures again. So I'm going to go and actually, I didn't yeah. check this because we ran the numbers. And, Let's do it. I don't and see. I, stopped, I wasn't interested. But I'm seeing a. I'm seeing a gas meter right there. Yeah, one gas one. meter here. So, so uh, right, right there, that answers your question of whether it was purpose built or not, right? Because right. you're right. like, wait a second, it's one. Uh, okay, so I don't see it in that picture either. I see one hydro on the triplex, and mm -hmm. I don't see. Yeah, any so this isn't this isn't here. awesome because it, you, you're not going to have the opportunity to to you know pawn that back off on the renter at, at any time, right? You're going to always have to include uh hydro and gas included you'll never be able to to kind of split unless unless you go and and re, redo them all totally totally and here they're saying cash for keys opportunity in the descriptor so they're saying hey if you want to offer cash to have someone move on and then you can raise rents for somebody else again that's an opportunity and that's good for purchasing a property to have as a bonus as a benefit but it's not something like that increases the value of the property, you know, like it's it's actually more of a hindrance. So there's a future benefit there. I like that. Hmm. But we've lost the future benefit of potentially yeah. getting rid of the hydro and gas. It doesn't make it a deal breaker, though. Like we, no, have we, we haven't even run the numbers yet, really. We yeah, just, we're yeah. just looking we, at we've got some properties that don't have separate meters. And, and when you explore adding separate meters, oftentimes it's a very big expense. So it, it's not a deal breaker, but does the does it actually work here? So that's where we're going to pull out our property analyzer. And on our episode where we shared a, you know, kind of chopped down property mm -hmm. analyzer, which mm -hmm. is very helpful. Hopefully mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. those people who downloaded it. We'll share the link in the show notes. Those who downloaded that one, hopefully that's helpful for you. I'm going to use one uh, that I typically use. It's kind of a modification of a few different ones that I had found online. And I, I apologize if I knew who was the original creator uh, oh, before I started playing with it. I would definitely um, make sure to mention their name and their web address. Um, but this is one that I've sort of worked with. So here's the one I'm going to look at. Okay. I'm going to list these side by side, John, so that I can kind of play here. But I've already pre-populated a couple things, but I just want to show people how you know, using an analyzer can make your life really easy. So mm -hmm. what I do, I just make a copy of the last one that I've worked on. So you can see it even says copy in the, in the file name here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I leave everything as is. You'll notice a bunch of gibberish sometimes to the side that may or may not even apply to this property. Um, but what I've done is I've taken this and I'm going to put in my $1,390,000 okay. for that. And I'm going to use a 30% down payment. This is going to be considered a commercial, um, a commercial deal. And if you're buying in a corp, it's going to be likely 75 or 70% loan to value. In most okay. cases, if you buy mm -hmm. personally with more than four units, you're typically dealing with commercial as well. And they usually get you down to 70 in, in this market. Sometimes they're even pushing you down to 65% loan to value. Um, interest rate I've got at about 6%. And our amortization, I have over 25 years. Again, if you have an opportunity to stretch that out, that's going to help your cash flow numbers. However, I know some of the lenders we work with most often typically are around 25. So that's mm -hmm, what we mm -hmm. use just to kind of give us a starting point here. All right. Okay. So we've we gotta... got some built in closing costs, John, here mm -hmm. that are kind of estimated. I always use a larger percentage for property uh, or sorry, land transfer tax. So I overshoot on this a little bit instead of using the step system and, and make it too complicated. So I just, I like to make sure the closing costs are, are going to be, you know, more than covered. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be around 25 or 26,000. Okay. Our down payment looks like a uh, 417 at this price point. Okay. All right. So on that closing cost, Kyle, you had a, you had a little calculator, you know, a formula built in there. Is there anything that, that uh, our listeners should know about um, what you're using there? You said you wanted to be conservative on that part, but, uh, but do you want to film in on like a, what you're, what you're doing to calculate that part? Just so yeah, they get a good estimation. I 
I, I toss in three thousand dollars for closing costs in general, like legal fees, any of the other stuff. It, right. it, it, that should be more than enough. But I, I again, conservatively, we like to just make sure okay. we've got padding because you just never know. And then basically, what I'm doing is I'm taking the purchase price. I'm using one point six five percent. Um, as the number for land transfer tax. Gotcha. How, how, gotcha. However, those who know land transfer tax, it works much like our graduated tax right. system where you you know once you hit a level, Got you it. know the number goes up, the number goes up. So I'm using just sort of like an average e number there just to kind of make sure we're covering ourselves without gotcha. making the calculation too chaotic. Um, so right. we've got a total cash investment out of pocket of 442,000 or 443,000 about in order to get into this 11 plex deal. Right. All right. Yep. So I have a section down here that I'm not using, but you could play with things like adding sweat equity, improving the property, other, you know, uh, and then refinancing. We're not going to play in that area at, at all on this deal, but right away you can see this one spits out a monthly mortgage payment of $6,269 every month. Mm -hmm. So right away, when I looked at that, and I don't consider anything else, I looked at, oh, wait a right. second. We were making nine, almost 10, like nine, seven on on our, our revenue on just what the rents were listed at. Absolutely. Uh, so right so now, I was super excited. Like yeah, watch what bad. happens when I plug it in. So I, I actually got excited about it because I was like, Oh, there's like, there's some meat on the bone here, right? right. So, okay, I'm going to paste that in. And all of a sudden I go, well, wait a second. Here's my rents. Mm -hmm. uh, my rents come out here. Yep. And here's going to be my monthly net cash flow if there was no other expenses, which we know is not true here. So right. I was like, wow, $1,800 of cash flow. All right. The numbers here look pretty decent. Not like knock it out of the park, but we also know they were saying there's an opportunity to raise rents on some of these yep. units, right? Yep. Like I see yep. two units are in the 500s, uh, a few of them are in the 800s and 900s, and then a few of them are in like above $1,000. So right there, just looking at that as a sample size, not knowing that market very well, I'm going, okay, like this could be a good deal and offer an opportunity to kind of have some growth yeah. in that uh, return not, over time. Yeah. And not to mention some of the other bullets we talked about at this point, you just knowing, you know, how much mortgage you're paying down, you're, you know, you're, you're getting a, you're getting a benefit of a $17,000 mortgage pay down. Um, you know, our analyzer uh, calculates that for you to see like how much you're paying down the mortgage. So that, remember that that helps build your equity in the home uh, or the property at a, at a later time. So that's like part of the way we look at our investment. Uh, we got appreciation. Uh, we usually use about 3% appreciation per year. So in this first year, we have about Kyle's Kyle's calculations here have about $41,000 in appreciation. So that's that's a nice benefit. So we can use that to also help calculate how much our kind of return in one year might look. Might look. And then uh, our cash flow without anything else is about $21,000 a year um, at this time. But Kyle, we haven't uh, so like th that that would give us some good numbers like that would be great right like i think you're looking at your first year return on return on your investment is like 18 percent. so that that does look great uh however kyle we haven't included any of the other expenses yet that's just mortgage so we haven't talked about the taxes we haven't talked about that remember that high hydro and gas bill and bringing in um you know property insurance um, we haven't talked about any of those other expenses that we account for, like like uh, capital expenditures, um, or you know we we have a, a property rental uh, uh, manager that would would manage this for us. We, we account for that in in the deal. So let's go back and kind of look at those things and uh, and uh, see where we go from here. Yeah. Now, one thing I will say, um, this, this particular analyzer automatically adds property management and repairs and vacancy at 7% and 10% if uh, you add in any rent. So that does that automatically. So mm -hmm. these numbers are based on those two expenses being included. So okay. that's better, right? Got like it. it's, it's good. It's like less, uh, less pain to be had here as we move along. Got it. But Got what it. we're going to do is we're going to slowly put these in. I've lined these up as best I can. I placed 
the taxes, which they have down as $11,000 in change. They had uh, hydro and gas as 22,600 and change. And they had insurance at 8,300 and change. And really, we're making an assumption here. Normally, if it's listed with an agent, you know, Rico says that you have to list accurate uh, amounts or you have to state that it's estimates. Here, they've just stated these and we don't know if these people are agents or, or who they are or whether this is true or an estimate. So these would all be things we'd have to follow up on as well. But let me go ahead and go, okay, well, let's look at our property taxes per month. We're going to take that number and we're going to spread it out over 12 months. We're going to do the same thing with our property insurance. And we're going to, I'm going to leave the utilities out just to kind just, of give just us for a, minute. a just sense for a minute. <laughs> here, right? Of how helpful the, you know, the separate meters could really be um, on any property, but in particular this one. So I add in those two expenses and really the only thing left for us to add in is the, is the utilities, the hydro and gas. So when mm -hmm. I look at these numbers and I go, okay, we're cash flowing only two hundred dollars now. So we month. were what we were. We were what all um, eighteen hundred. And now yeah, let me, adding let me those. Back it up. Yeah, adding adding those eighteen hundred. Yeah, we were now two hundred, uh, and we we're haven't brought in the two hundred dollars. The the gas or the electric. So two hundred dollars a month. We're looking at uh, twenty five hundred bucks ish a year. Uh, still not bad. Still not bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're looking at this, you're probably going, is this something I want to be, you know, running into? Probably not at this point, but it is still like cash flow yeah. positive, right? So you're yeah. like, okay, maybe, maybe you're seeing the benefit in the rents right. being increased over time, right? Or you're seeing in there, they also talk about how uh, one of the properties actually has enough room in the back of the property to actually add, I think it was three additional units. So yeah. that might be in your mind as well. One thing that I'm not going to do is I'm not going to make any speculative, um, you know, number crunching and buy the property at, at a negative cash flow no. in order to do those other things. Those are going to be like maybe why I would take less cash flow, right? Those or why cherry, it might yeah, be worth cherry on top kind of thing. Cherry on top, absolutely. So now let's let's take this. Um, we're going to take this utility cost. We're going to spread it out eighteen hundred dollars. Remember the old cash flow that eighteen hundred dollars of cash flow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have eighteen hundred and ninety dollars of utility costs every month. So, without considering any of the other expenses, originally our original cash flow got wiped out mm -hmm. by those utility costs, and we are now losing sixteen hundred dollars every month, almost seventeen hundred dollars every month. Mm -hmm. And now, I guess, again, I guess the upside for us yeah, to consider let's, is let's that- Let's go down and look at the return. Like if you include all three benefits, right? So so I think- Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so when you look at that and you go, okay, wait a second, let's have a, a, a peek here. When I look at that, I'm like, now I have, I'm losing $20,000 a year. So just picture this, like that's not like- it's not interest awesome. that you're paying or anything <laughs> like that was already accounted for. Yeah, yeah. This is like money that you Out need your to pocket. put into this par yeah. property every single month just to keep it right. And uh, sure. One thing you are getting is you're still going to get that appreciation, assuming it grows at 3% yeah. a year. Yeah. We can't guarantee that. Remember that was a cherry. That was one of the cherries, one of the silver bullets. Uh, and then the one thing you are going to get is mortgage pay down. So you're actually, yeah, you're it. taking $20,000. And you're basically taking your twenty thousand, and then you're swapping it for less mortgage paydown. Yeah, yeah, seventeen thousand mortgage paydown. It's like you're swapping it. It's like it's almost like you're paying the mortgage, uh, the benefit of that mortgage yourself, and hoping that you you eventually get appreciation. Right. Which which un unfortunately, like the past few years, especially the way the market has been booming and all those things, this happens in you know in cycles. That's sort of what people do in a lot mm -hmm. of cases. Like they are like betting on the market. And over the last few years, people won on that bet. But mm -hmm. it's not a, a try. It's not a great strategy is what we'll say, especially in this particular case, because, again, you are relying 
wholeheartedly on that appreciation, hoping that a couple years from now that this property is worth a lot more than what you bought it for here today. Now, if you were on YouTube and you actually looked at some of these images as well, let's keep in mind, like there's gonna be some capital expenditures going mm -hmm. into these buildings before too long. I, I, I don't care who you are, those buildings, there's, there's some, we'll, we'll call them a little rough on the edges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's our kind right. of building, but not for this kind of price. Yeah. And we're not even in the right market. I say right market. We're not even in so, our market. So it's like it's yeah. really hard for us to say, yeah, we're going to dive in so, on a deal like this one. Exactly. So if you think about where we've started, where we came from, we, we this came across our desk. We're kind of looking at it in real time here. But obviously the numbers aren't working here, Kyle. But this is where that statement about like the you know good deals are made and they're not just found. If you stopped here on every every deal you might never get a good one right like you, you you're right you're, you're right like every time you analyze and you're like nah the numbers aren't working the numbers aren't working based off the purchase price based off what you're seeing so let's let's dive in here and, and see what can we do to kind of sweeten this to make it work right like yeah. there, there's only so many things you can actually you can change about the the scenario um, like you're not going to be able to at this time change any of the, you know, the taxes and the insurance and, and, and these some of these numbers that are quoted on the screen. We talked about that. Like we can't all of a sudden just say, you know what, we're going to come in and we're going to make sure all the rents go up. Like, yeah. like we're not going to be able to change that kind of stuff. But we do have like one number we can play with. Yeah, totally. I mean, the one, uh, the obvious one to play with would be price. Mm -hmm. But before we do, I just want to show the impact of like rising interest rates because right. a lot of people look at it and they think like, oh, like, you know, the interest rate went up a quarter of a percent. You know, every time it goes up, it's going up a quarter percent. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, we're now in an environment where like interest rates, and this isn't for rental property rates, but you know, for just residential primary residences, there were people sub 2%. And now they're in mm -hmm. like the fives. And mm -hmm. you know, even for a little while there it was into the six. Um, so I've got a 6% interest rate here. Like imagine if we were to pop this down to like 3%, what that immediately does to our payment to our mortgage payment, look at that. It goes to forty six hundred dollars. Okay, and our ca our cash flow is almost break even, right? Right, like so that was like we halved the interest rate. Now, of course, that's not something we can realistically change unless you have an opportunity for a vendor take back, which John, you had mentioned earlier. In this case, this is an assignment deal, so these people actually don't own this property, and we have no idea who the actual seller is right. at this point. So a VTB is probably not in our cards, but that would be where I go on a VTB is like, hey, if, if we can be, if they can be flexible on the interest terms, because for a lot of people, when they're selling, like on a recent deal, they were selling because they just wanted to get out of real estate and just put it into like some safe stuff. They were retired. They are like, we have a nest egg that's big enough to support mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. We just want like, a, a, a predictable return every year. So I'm like, well, can I, can we give you a predictable return? Like we'll give you that predictable turn for 3%. And then therefore you're going to get a higher price and it's going to work. And, and they were okay with that. And it's not always going to be the case, but that's one thing you could adjust. The other thing is if you have a lender that's willing to do a longer amortization period. So I could go, you know, hey, if we could do a 40 year amortization, that's going to spread it out. Of course, your debt is going to get spread out, of course, over time. Doesn't quite have that same uh, effect as the interest rate. I'm sure if I doubled it instead of, uh, in, instead of, um, you know, only increasing it to 40 years, if I go to 50 years, we're still at $500 of negative cash flow because that interest, that high interest cost is just so high. So that's not gonna really help us a whole lot here either, nor do I know of too many lenders out there who mm -hmm. are openly yeah. willing yeah. to do this longer amortization period, at least at the current time. So we're gonna go to price and we're gonna start playing with price and we're gonna go like, how far off are we? I love that 125 per unit number, but I'm not liking where we're at. So usually what I wanna do is I wanna get down and see like, where's my break even point? Like if I go 1.1 million, and uh, you know, benefit obviously is our down payment 
goes down mm-hmm, and you know mm-hmm. our closing costs are gonna like everything's gonna go down here it's great i come down my mortgage payments much lower at 1.1 1. 1, we're close we're, we're close. still in the hole 300 dollars, but that's a lot better than where we were before i'm gonna go right down to one million dollars and when i go to one million dollars my my closing costs including a three hundred thousand dollar down payment and you know land transfer and all that that's about 320,000 out of pocket and when we go down oh i am now in the positive cash flow territory i'm at 78 dollars so now in my head i'm going hmm how do i how do we work within these this environment and we can still touch base with the seller get a sense of where they are and then usually what we do is we just share you know the fact of where we're at so this is the message that i sent this morning instead of like you said just mm-hmm. moving on and and never having an opportunity i'm going to be very you know cordial about it i'm not going to be rude um i said i just ran some napkin numbers and it doesn't cash flow at these numbers Um, And they said, okay, bring your best offer, it works. And then I went on to try to push them and say, well, I think you know the numbers where it cash flows. So, I mean, we don't wanna bring a formal offer until we can at least get somewhere close. You know that neighborhood, is that something that you think would be worthwhile for you? And it sounds like that's something that's on the table from their end. So we're gonna Mm. dig into this further we don't know if it's going to go anywhere but ultimately what we just did and you and i did it in a a much lengthier um, approach it usually (laughs) takes me 10 15 minutes to do this is i get to play with these numbers and basically this is like the underwriting of a deal and i can't remember where i heard it i heard it somewhere on a podcast where they said it's like you it's free to underwrite as many deals as you as you can Mm -hmm. so the whole goal here is like don't just look at a deal and then go, uh, eh, it doesn't look good. It's right. like, no, underwrite the deal, play with the deal, try to be creative with the deal so that maybe, maybe there's an outside chance that something could happen here. Now, because this is out of our, our area, we're not going to like get all emotional about this. You know, we're going to see where they're at. They're going to figure out where we're at and yep. they're, we're going to see like, is this even worthwhile? And where this, I anticipate where it goes, John, is I anticipate that they go, mm, no thanks. And we go, no problem. Let us know. And then sometimes like our 10 plex that we have near your place there, John, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes people get in a pinch. And then all of a sudden it's a different ball game, just like the person they probably bought these properties from or, or have signed agreements from, they may have been in a tight pinch. Well, these assigners may find themselves in a tough pinch. If everybody is looking at the deal, the way we're looking at it, it doesn't actually make sense unless let's say you had $1.4 million of cash in your bank, right? right? And now you don't have a mortgage payment and you're just looking to put it in any old property. That might be the deal for that person. But if they can't find that person, they now have our contact. They now know where we stand. And there may be that opportunity where they come back and say, hey guys, listen, we're two weeks out. We got to make this happen. Let's, you know, let's revisit your original offer. Yeah. So maybe in a future episode, we'll revisit and see what the you know scenario happens after this. Because as, as we said, this came across our desk just today. Um, but we wanted to share it with you to give you a sense of some of the thought process that we go through when we're looking at deals, how to how to structure it so that it can work uh, and reach out and, and see see what's possible. Um, that's that's why we want to do that, do that for you. And so you get that sense and also kind of that experience. And, and one of the things we're going to say and, and recommend is that the more deals you do that with, the more ones that come across, uh, the more ones you search out on MLS and run the numbers, just like we just did here and see what is possible and reach out and, and to uh, say a realtor or whoever this deal, like this one is, is, a, is a different scenario, but th- you'll get a better sense. You'll get more confident in with what you're doing and you're gonna be one step closer to changing, you know, your financial future when you start to go down this pathway of real estate investing. So, so that is why we wanted to share this particular one. 
Cal, I think we said we would just do this in about 20 minutes and it's been more than double that. So uh, that's we're, the way it always rolls. Hey, my we, friend. we wanted to make sure you got your money's worth here on listening to this podcast. So uh, uh, let's uh, let's get wrapping up here, Cal. Absolutely. Well, I, I think just in what you had said, it, it was sort of a, a big takeaway for you and, and something for the audience to think about. I, I think the big takeaway I hope everyone gets from this is, again, is that every deal is possibly a good deal, right? Like right. every deal is possibly a good deal. Not out of the box, right? It's never going to come out of the box that way because guess what? It's already going to be, that box is going to be empty by the time it reaches you if it's that good of a deal on right. paper. Right. So just keep that in mind. And you know, the more times you look at this stuff, the one thing you don't want to get yourself caught up in is getting stuck on any one of these, we'll call it a metric, right? Like any one of these numbers, the 1% rule, it's not a rule. It's a, it, it's a rule of thumb. It's a, a target. It's an idea. It's a starting point. It may be a benchmark, but ultimately if we looked at this right away, doesn't meet the 1% rule, I could throw it away. Well, then that deal is never going to see the light of day. The other piece is I'm going, wow, 125 per unit. That is good for our market. I could say, we got to buy this property because it's 125 per unit and we can't find 125 per, per unit, you know, if, if life depended on it around here. Mm -hmm. So then we go all in th getting all emotional, thinking that this is the deal for us. But in reality, there's so many other factors here where, it, you know, maybe 125 in that market, maybe it's not that great. I mean, the comps we see are suggesting otherwise, but right. those are only two comps. So once again, don't let a deal just float by just because one thing looks out of place or don't let a deal uh, or go all in on a deal simply because one metric or one number looks really good. So hopefully you get that from this episode. Uh, friends, if you are finding this helpful, it is incredibly helpful if you help us out by leaving a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform that you might be on. Every time that you do that, it tells the uh, or the uh, organic traffic, not the organic traffic, but the, um, what do they call them? The algorithm. The algorithm. algorithm. There it is. The algorithm uh, to share it with more people just like you, right? They know who you are. They're like, hmm, people like this, they're into investing. Oh, yeah, they liked this, so these other people will like it too. So do us a huge favor and help us out that way, and we look forward to bringing you awesome, awesome content and tips and hopefully some deals that you might want to partner with us on in the future. All links and resources and uh, transcript for this episode can be found over at our show notes page, investedteacher.com forward slash episode 16. Uh, that's investedteacher.com forward slash episode 16. And like Kyle said just a moment ago, folks, um, if you uh, are interested in getting involved in uh, real estate investing and are not sure um, exactly how to kind of get your foot in the door or you're wondering, you know, is this the right spot to, to you know, or is this the right deal? And uh, you would like to have someone who's, you know, been there before, help you out, be your guide. Uh, that's what we do. We, we partner with people uh, just like you who, to get, help them get their foots in the foots, their feet in the door uh, to, uh, to get involved in real estate. So we would partner with you. If you're interested in doing that, uh, reach out to us at investedteacher.com forward slash JV. Again, that's investedteacher.com forward slash JV. I love it. John, until next time, class is dismissed. Just a quick reminder, the content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice.